Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Nyla Bolas, President and CEO of Jumpstart. Jumpstart is a national early education organization working toward the day that every child in America enters kindergarten prepared to succeed. Nyla has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Nyla, for joining us today. Thank you, Mark. My pleasure. So entering into kindergarten, but ensuring that children are entering into kindergarten prepared to succeed, is there really a distinction between children who are prepared to succeed and children who are not prepared to succeed in kindergarten? I know. It seems strange, doesn't it? Because we're talking about five-year-olds. Right. But in fact, there is a very real distinction. And there's been a lot of research done now over the past couple decades that teach us what children actually need to be prepared to succeed academically in school, but also so socially in school. And we know that children who are coming from low-income backgrounds are entering kindergarten sometimes 60% or that, that translates to the equivalent of about 18 months behind their peers. So simple things that you, know, you wouldn't even think twice about, but how do you hold a pencil correctly? Do you know that a book opens and that you read from left to right and the pages turn this way? That sounds are, are correspond with specific letters. All those kinds of things, which maybe feel just natural to us, are really critical for children's academic foundation and help them to learn for the rest of their academic careers. So there are behavioral uh, issues. There are also fundamental issues which are not really about the ability to absorb information. It, it, it really is about being prepared with the expectations of how things function mm -hmm. within a school environment because if a child is paralyzed for the first three or four months of being in amongst strangers uh, they can't learn because they're they're dealing with their own fears right that's exactly right and so many of these children from low-income communities are also experiencing enormous amounts of what we now call toxic stress so children who are in in poverty children who might experience violence in their homes who are concerned about not having several parents in the home or are going from home to home, don't have a place to live, that kind of toxic stress environment actually inhibits their ability to learn both the cognitive side, right, and the non-cognitive side. So let's take it from the point of view of not the parent, not others who are trying to help these families. Let's take it from the point of view of the child, his or herself. A child is born, the parents have low income, they are uh, born within circumstances where even the fact of, of that birth is causing stress because the parents might not be able to pay whatever medical expenses there are, um, may not have any type of a family support system. That baby, as, as they're beginning to understand their environment, they're actually under they're actually exposed to an environment that is not necessarily as supportive as other children and so they start with really behind the eight ball how do you how in the world do you make up for that kind of a disadvantage well one of the other things we know is that period of a child's life their brain is developing at a faster rate than at any other point in their lives so they are primed, ready to learn, and we know through many studies that have been done over the decades that high quality early education, the kind of intervention that Jumpstart does with children in the classroom, pays dividends down the road because you're intervening right at that point where it really matters, and if you can level the playing field and give these children the chance to succeed, and it goes up to the point where they're in third grade. So if a child is not reading proficiently by the end of third grade, they're about four times more likely to drop out of high school. And the reason that there's that marker at the end of third grade, and remember these are eight-year-olds, right, that we're right. talking about. So but the reason there's that marker is because children go from learning to read to reading to learn. At what point does Jumpstart get involved in the lives of these children, and how does that actually happen? So Jumpstart focuses on three to five-year-olds, so these are preschool or pre-kindergarten right. children. We go into existing classrooms, so we're primarily in Head Start centers, community-based classrooms, and then a number of public schools also are starting to have pre-K classrooms. Mm -hmm. 
and we serve in these schools over the course of a year and we deliver a curriculum that has been evolved and developed for Jumpstart over time that is specifically focused on those core language literacy and then the social emotional developmental skills that children need to be successful. And we train primarily college students, but we also have a growing core of older adults. We give them significant training on everything from, you know, sort of childhood development issues, early education, classroom management, all those kinds of things. And then they go into the classroom, they work very intensively with a small group of children over the course of a year. We have what we call a jumpstart session, which is two hours long, and it happens twice a week. A team of these volunteers go into the classroom and then first they break up into small groups so you have one adult working with two to three children and then they go through the whole class comes together we have what we call circle time and then they have center time so children are learning all of these core skills and at the end of the year we measure their success pre and post and we find that our children are making significant academic gains. So the volunteers are also getting something from it. They are becoming educators. They are becoming specialists in these um, skills of how to spot need and how to address those needs through these variety of techniques. And so you are breaking down these techniques and providing specific education to these volunteers. Exactly. It's very intentional, the way that we do our work. So you might look at a lesson plan and say, wow, this is so scripted. It's not scripted. It's intentional. Because every single word we use matters. We are, we are intentionally using very rich vocabulary. So the children are reading, you know, one of my favorite books. We have 20 core storybooks that go over a, a number of themes throughout the course of the year. One of my favorites is Little Red Hen Makes a Pizza. It's sort of a modern <laughs> twist on the Little Red Hen story. But so she makes this pizza and she brings all these ingredients and they're things like mozzarella cheese and these little, you know, three and four year olds are learning how to spell mozzarella, understanding what mozzarella cheese is right. and, you know, being able to use these words as they go forward in their lives. And then the rest of our, of the Jumpstart session really follows the theme. So we have something that's called Let's Find Out About It, where a smaller group of children will go and meet with the team leader and dig deeper into the subject. There's always some kind of a scientific experiment that's connected with the book. There's dramatic play, there's books, there's writing. So we're bringing art. We're bringing all of these different kinds of activities and learning together to foster this love of learning, but also help children see the connections. In terms of, of finding children who participate, are the, are the children, do they naturally participate because you're associated with other programs like Head Start or do you actually go out and recruit children who would seem to be good um, uh, targets to benefit from, the, from Jump Start? So up until this point we have worked just in existing traditional classrooms. So if your child goes to a Head Start Center, and it's a Head Start Center that is a partner with Jump Start, then they will get the Jump Start program because every child in the class gets the program. Mm -hmm. We're thinking more about ways to reach children that are not in the traditional classrooms because there's a large percentage of children who are in family daycare settings or other kinds of daycare that are not a classroom. Right. It's more challenging for us. I think this is one of our strategic challenges to figure out because we go into a classroom and there are 20 children there that we can serve. So we can bring our teams from college or from you know the community members into these classrooms. It's a little more complicated when you start talking about dozens and dozens of providers who might have three children ages, you know, six months to six, right. and how we work with our target group of three to five year olds, because our curriculum is very developmentally specific for that age group. How do you fund your organization? So we are funded by, there's government funding and then private funding. Our government funding this year is a little less than 40%, okay. and on the private side it's foundations, corporations, and individuals. And the, the funding that you get from the government is is that a fee-for-service type model in which you are required through your letters of agreement to provide very specific um, services? Um, and, and if you don't provide those services, your funding uh, disappears. Our funding, our government funding is through AmeriCorps, and which is part of the national service mm -hmm. um, movement, really. It's a, it's a movement. And 
part of this goes back to something you said before that I actually would like to spend a little bit of time talking about, which is the experience that our volunteers, or we call them core members because they're part of AmeriCorps, actually get through this process. So the, the funding from AmeriCorps enables us to be able to identify, recruit, train college students who work part-time with us. A lot of AmeriCorps, they're full-time, like after they've actually graduated right. college. But this is an opportunity for us to introduce the concept of national service at a younger age in college and also start to shape the way that they think about their civic engagement, their responsibility. We know their experience with Jumpstart actually impacts their college, like how successful that they are in college. And then the kinds of things that are going to be so useful for them in terms of their workforce development later on in life. And I am always so inspired. Like, I love going to the classroom with the children, of course, because you see just the curiosity and the eagerness and just the, I don't know, the, the power of that relationship between the adult and the child. But then when you sit down and you talk to the core members and you hear their experiences, many of them, in fact, almost half of, of our core across the country, and we have 4,300 college students who work with us, about half of them are first generation college students themselves. So many of them are coming from the communities we serve. They have this very strong ethic of giving back. But it also provides such inspiration for the children who see people who look like them, who have gone to college, you know, who are successful academically, and it, it sets the expectation bar high. Let's talk ab about the, the actual uh, infrastructure that you have in place to support this very complex uh, organization. <laughs> what is it composed of? How many full-time, not, not the volunteers now, mm -hmm. full-time employees the, uh, that you have? What, what does your budget look like and so mm -hmm, on? Mm -hmm. Great. So our budget for this year is about $19 million. We have under 200 staff. And the way that that's divided is we have a national office headquarters that supports the work that happens all across the country. And that is located? And that's located in Boston. Okay. And then we have seven what we call regions where we have offices of different sizes. So we have three that are focused just on an individual city. So that is Washington, D.C., Atlanta, and Chicago. And in those places we have executive directors and additional staff on the ground. Plus, at every university site where we have volunteers, we have what's called a site manager. So there's somebody who's based in the university, who interacts with the university, does the recruitment, does the training, does all of that. And uh, your headquarters, you, there you're developing the pedagogies and, and, uh, and then uh, deploying those out into the various regions? Right. So we have a whole research and development team that is following the trends. So like just for example, we're looking more deeply now into social emotional learning concepts. Mm -hmm. And how our curriculum supports that and if we want to actually you know have have sort of deeper or expand the elements of our curriculum so we have a lot of innovative thinking going on with that group in research and development then of course we have an evaluation team right. we measure everything we do so that's on the programmatic side they also put forward new trainings and you know there's a lot of back and forth between the field and the national office because there's a lot of expertise in the field as well and that's where the work is happening in the classrooms let's talk about evaluation because that, that's always a, that's always a really uh, interesting topic. Mm -hmm. uh, so often, when you see evaluation teams put together, um, it, it's almost with a a, a a predetermination of what the results are going to be. Hmm. Right? You look at something hard enough, and you can make those numbers kind of appear out of uh, out of magic. How do you ensure that the evaluation that that you are doing is not a, a self-satisfied, you're evaluating yourself and declaring yourself a success, but <laughs> ensuring that the skeptics are looking at, mm. at your programs and, and declaring you a success. Right, right. That's a great question. And, you know, first of all, let's start with, well, why do we do evaluation? Well, number one, you do it to improve your program. So if your evaluation is not telling you something about how you're doing, what's the point of doing it? Of course, the second reason you do evaluation is to tell your story right. and to get funders to support you both on the government and private side. And if that is incredible, it's not going to have its, exactly its intended right. effect either. That's exactly right. So how right. do you make it credible? So, well, first of all, we do both internal and external evaluation. So internally, we have a tool that we 
have used that has been developed. It's a proprietary tool for us, but it specifically measures our curriculum. Mm -hmm. And external evaluators have come in and have actually looked at it and you know sort of given us their opinion on whether or not this is a legitimate tool. It is a legitimate tool. There are limitations to it though, I will say, because it is what's called an observational tool. Mm -hmm. So a teacher sits down with a child and observes a whole set of things that are on our evaluation and then rates that child. Right. So you have, when you have different abilities in the teacher's ability to be able to rate, you know, your, your results sometimes can be skewed. Right. So we are moving now towards a direct measure, which will more, I think, accurately capture the gains that our children make. But I will say, this tool that we've used up until this point, we've used it, you know, for many, many years, and the results have been consistent over time. So I think that's been important to know. But we also then couple that with external independent researchers who design their own study mm -hmm. and come in and look at Jumpstart compared to you know, other children of similar demographic characteristics. And they'll look at sometimes the whole program, sometimes they'll look at a specific aspect. Last year we did a really interesting study on vocabulary. This year we also just concluded a very interesting study on Jumpstart's impact on children's toxic stress. What kind of intelligence have you been able to assemble through these various efforts, and how have you changed your programs over the years in response to that intelligence? Great question. Um, I think there have been a number of, of pieces of information that we've gained from our evaluation that has really helped shape what the program looks like today. Going back before my time, we did some look looking into the effectiveness of one-on-one -on -one because originally Jumpstart actually was what is called a pull-out model where mm -hmm. we would go in and pick the children who are most in need and they would be pulled out of the classroom and have like a tutoring relationship. But we did a study that actually looked at the power of dyads versus triads and from that information decided that it actually would be more beneficial for Jumpstart to serve the entire classroom. So and dyads one to one, one to one versus dyads. one to two. One to two. So right, you now so one have adult, groups. two children. Exactly, groups. So go from one to one to a small group, exactly right. as you said. So that then spawned a whole inquiry into what would a full classroom curriculum actually look like. And so we piloted that over a period of four years and then we rolled that out. So the model that you see today is actually something that is fairly new. That full rollout happened just before I started at Jumpstart. Um, a little over two years ago. So, and then we've been checking that along the way. One other thing just to mention, I think is, is um, has been very interesting to us. We have noticed over the past several years as we're looking at our data that our children who are dual language learners that we serve are having statistically significantly greater results on the evaluation, even when you hold their baselines constant. Right. So that's really interesting to us. What's going on there? So we actually then, from that, launched a study this past year that has dug much deeper into what is it about our curriculum and the relationships between the adult and the children that works with dual language learners so that we can capitalize on that and expand in that area. In terms of, of your own career evolution, you've had a, a rather interesting uh, evolution toward this position. Mm -hmm. um, talk about how your career has, has uh, developed over the last years. Mm -hmm. So I have spent most of my career working in the field of foreign policy. And up until previously, previous to Jumpstart, I spent a significant amount of time running a public foundation called Plowshares Fund that was focused on nuclear nonproliferation and oversaw a pretty major transformation with that organization, um, the death of the founder, expanding to a public policy office in Washington, D.C., um, growing an endowment, number of things like that. And I was ready for change. I had been there for a long time and really wanted to take the lessons that I had learned in helping an organization kind of go from one level to the next level. Everything I had learned about board development, all of those pieces, I wanted to put them um, to an issue that was different to kind of move a little bit away from the policy conversation and be in an environment where I could see the direct impact day to day on the lives of people that the organization I was leading 
um, was impacting. I think for me, too, I have always, always been motivated by mission. I mean, I'm a person who is um, inspired by big, bold missions, and kind of the bigger, the better. Um, the more sort of seemingly impossible, the better, because it feels to me like if, if we can really make a difference in early education and close that kindergarten readiness gap, like what an amazing accomplishment. Nyla Bolas, thank you so much for sharing your experience with Jumpstart and this amazing program, and thank you for your insights. Thank you so much, Mark. It was a great conversation. Thank you.